The most successful brands, and indeed those that have the largest EBIT, are the ones where people buy into the brand first. Do you buy into Nike or are you buying a pair of trainers? Hey there, James here, and you're listening to the Own the Moment podcast, the show where we explore the complex and always evolving landscape of marketing, advertising, and branding, and try to get to the bottom of what it means to be a truly memorable brand. The Own the Moment podcast is brought to you by Como Technologies, a self-service, complete customer engagement platform that helps you cut through the noise to truly connect with your customers and retain and grow those connections over time. With Como, you can build and deploy new campaigns, activations, promotions, and programs in days, not months. And our software is used by some of the world's biggest consumer brands from Heineken to Budget, Goodman Fielder, Foxtel, JLL, Williams Racing, and McDonald's. Learn more at como.tech. Today's guest is Melissa Hopkins, the Chief Marketing and Audience Officer at Seven West Media. Recently ranked number four on the CMO50 list, which recognises Australia's most innovative and effective marketing leaders, Melissa is undoubtedly one of Australia's top marketing executives. Prior to joining Seven, Mel was the CMO at Optus, and prior to that held a global head of brand and communications role at Vodafone in the UK. For those listening outside Australia, Seven West Media is Australia's largest diversified media business with an extensive network of brands and products across TV, streaming, newspapers, and online publishing. The Seven Network, or Seven as it's known to Aussies, their flagship TV brand, reaches an astonishing 17 million Australians a month, which for context is as many Australians as YouTube reaches every month. Despite all of this, Mel told me that she was initially cautious about joining Seven, but as she learned more about the opportunity to redefine a category that many saw as having its best days behind it, she couldn't resist the challenge. Mel and I had a great discussion about why TV isn't dying, why mass cultural events are so critical for advertisers, how they will take up the fight to global entertainment leaders like Netflix, and how CMOs can win back their seat at the boardroom table. I hope you enjoy the show. Mel Hopkins, thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you. Um, Mel, I wanted to start with a maybe a tricky question, but what attracted you to the job at Seven? I read somewhere that you described the industry as a business that everyone knows need to change. For, for those that don't spend their days thinking about broadcast media, sort of, you know, what attracted you to the job? Why did you join? It's a great question. I mean, the, the honest answer is um, I wasn't very interested when I was approached. Um, <laughs> And, and part of that was, you know, I, a, a sort of quite traditional marketing background working in large corporates. Media is a very different beast. A lot of my peers have either come from sales or trade. And I wasn't sure it was going to have um, the scope and breadth that I really needed in, in my next role. And I was very happy at Optus. Mm. I met with James Wharton um, a couple of times. And I think what became really, really clear is, James didn't want the regular type of leader coming in. He was broadening the scope of the role. But indeed, because the industry is going through such transformation and challenge at the moment, he wanted an individual that had a good track record in, in not only just delivering on that, um, but, but that was passionate. For me, it was less about joining media. Uh, hmm. It was absolutely about the opportunity and I love building things, creating, transforming ambiguity. I struggle in environments where I need to manage the status quo and, and that mm. very much I found attractive and, you know, Seven is a very latent um, household brand in Australia and I saw the challenge. Mm. What do you mean by latent household brand? Sort of, could you elaborate on that a little bit? I think you know, Seven, like many um, free to air, and probably indeed some of the other content players, and we can touch on it, has lost its relevance. So mm. you know, back when I was way younger, um, you know, Seven was as mm. cool as a as a Facebook or an Instagram or a Google or an Apple mm. as a brand, and and I think that absolutely was love there and. If you look at other markets like the UK, the true love and connection with something like the BBC is remarkable. Mm. I think um, 
people love a lot of the programming that they see on Seven, but I'm not sure that Australians see Seven as part of the fabric of Australia. Um, That's interesting. Why, why do you think that? Yeah, why, sorry to interrupt now. Why do you think that is, As you know, you know, I guess comparing to, you know, a BBC or someone else, you know, why, why do you think it's the programming but not the brand that sort of Yeah, I think this is where you've got it? to take it out of category. So the BBC is very different. Um, it's been an institution in the UK for a long time and indeed viewing habits in the UK are incredibly different to Australia. People still stay at home mm. on Saturday nights and watch television before going to the pub and, and that doesn't happen oh, wow. here in Australia. Um, but, you know, I think that I think what tends to happen with really mature um, or as sort of categories start maturing, they get a little bit complacent. You end up then mm. getting new entrants coming in. The new entrants come in as being sort of sexier and cooler and people sort of mm. move towards that. And I think you sort of end up being on the back foot a little, I guess, sort of thinking it's about the programming versus the brand itself. Look, if I'm honest... I don't really think there's many content or um, television brands globally that set themselves apart as a brand and market mm -hmm. themselves. And that indeed for me was the massive attraction of coming here because I want Seven to be seen in the fabric of Australia in the same way that Bunnings is, where it is just mm -hmm. a institution. And as much as Bunnings democratises home renovation, you know, Seven should be democratising mass cultural experiences, which is what we deliver every day. Mm, that's fascinating because, you know, just like that that idea of, um, you know, the brand rather than the programming being sort of the main thing, I mean, that feels counterintuitive to me. Um, sort of can we unpack that a little bit? I mean, and I guess just thinking through in my own mind, you know, is it Netflix or is it is it HBO or is it White Lotus that I'm really attracted to? How do you, you know, think about that? Because, again, that for me sounds counterintuitive that the programming wouldn't be sort of the, the I guess, the driving force behind the brand, but actually you can sort of build the brand. How do you think about that opportunity? Well, I think, um, I think there's a couple of things. So I think the first thing I'd say is I'd challenge you on that being ca counterintuitive. That's how marketing works. You buy brands, mm -hmm. you very rarely buy right. the product, right? right? So the most successful brands and indeed those that have the largest EVERT are the ones where people buy into the brand first, mm. less product first. So um, do you buy into Nike or are you buying a pair of trainers? Mm. Mm. Um, it makes total sense right? when so you say it like that. The, the fact that this industry hasn't even considered that is a, is a challenge within itself I think the other thing we've got to be really open about is, um, and, you know, I'm talking about, you know, at seven with where we are, is content is not our IP. Our IP is market access. We sell, we sell eyeballs for brands. That is, that is what we do mm. every single day. So it, it's no different actually to probably, you know, Uber doesn't sell, you know, accommodation it, it, it sells the opportunity for people to go and stay places. It's sort of all of a sudden made market access mm. of um, people getting to choose to have their own personalised experiences. So I think, you know, the old thinking is, well, you can't do that. It's counterintuitive. Um, mm. We don't sell programs. We sell, mm. we sell an experience and we sell audiences. Mm. obviously the programming is important to get there but again that's no different to if I go back to the Nike example if the product shit mm. um, then you won't buy it if it falls to pieces if it doesn't perform if you don't feel it's yep. good value so absolutely the product needs to be um, strong but yeah it is are you buying sand shoes or are you buying Nike Mm. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's really, really um, interesting. And so I guess, you know, thinking about sort of traditional broadcasters, you know, I guess, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I guess like the conventional view is that, you know, that's a, a, a medium or a model that's just sort of slowly dying. You mentioned becoming irrelevant. Um, you know, walk me through what's the sort of the bull case for um, brands like Seven and I guess, you know, the industry at large, you know, where, where can they be in five or 10 years and what's the journey they have to go on to um, reverse that trend and I guess potentially Mel starting with you know is that conventional wisdom correct you know are these is this medium slowly dying look I think it varies the market you're in I'll say where we are it's bullshit absolutely 
not. Um, do I think that all of the players will remain? No. And again, you know, this is an industry that is 70 years young or old, that is going through its first sort of secular shift and change of new entrants coming in, just as much as insurance or banking or telco indeed mm. has. And it's got to work out how it matures and who wins going through that. I think um, there's a couple of things that we just sort of need to consider a myth bus that as an industry, we haven't done well. So in 20 years, the viewing consumption has changed dramatically. Um, you know, you used to watch something on a, a DVD and, and, and a television with an aerial and you, you had three channels and, and now there's probably an abundance of up to 20 different platforms in Australia that you can choose to watch from. But the fact of the matter is people aren't watching less content all the same. So all the data shows, particularly in Australia, people are watching more long-form content than ever. I think that we've sort of been trapped in the same measurement system that we were 20 years prior, which was all jammed on overnight ratings. That's not how mm. the other players work. Indeed, some of those other streaming players won't even share their viewing figures. But even if you then start looking in a digital world, it's around reach and impressions. Mm. So the big thing that, you know, we've been doing and I've worked on sort of coming in out of industry is really trying to get under the data of, of reach. So oh, right. seven um, reaches 17.5 million Australians every single month. Mm -hmm. I'm really proud to say that YouTube also reaches 17 million Australians a month. So oh, I'm, wow. I, I think, you know, you, you sit, if, if we're sitting in that company, I, I, I don't think that that is a um, category that is dead, you know. Right. FIFA Women's World Cup, our reach was 5 million Australians. Um, mm. You know, we're seeing a lot of our programming growing year on year. So I think it's less about um, it being digital or television. Um, I think it is more about being and, 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 mm. and also then for us repackaging the job that we do. We're great for long-form content where you want high engagement with non-skippable advertising um, mm -hmm. and digital's great. I love it. I spent a huge amount of money on digital in my in my previous um, um, jobs and I will continue mm -hmm. to spend money on digital here because that is also um, important. But we just need mm -hmm. to, to myth bust and I think too many people in the industry have had their heads in the sand instead of actually taking a step back and, and looking at where we are. So, no, I, I, yeah. I don't... I don't think seven is dead, far from it. Yeah, that's fascinating. I, I, you know, in prep for this, I read, um, yeah, the brilliant Tom Roach. He has a great article called TV Isn't Dying, It's Having Babies, you know, talking about this idea that, right, we're watching more TV than ever. Um, in fact, we're watching more TV, TV than we ever have, but just in sort of new formats and in new shapes. So obviously, you know, live versus digital versus um, uh, on demand, et cetera. So what role do you think, I mean, thinking about seven, Mel, what role does sort of seven play in in the sort of the slice of 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 that viewing? You know, you, you talked about mass cultural events, which I guess for me feels like that's the one where, you know, whether it's the World Cup or the Olympics or whatever it might be, you know, what role, you know, what content fits on a seven versus, say, uh, a native digital streaming platform? How do you guys think about sort of... Um, content selection and sort of the role that you play in, you know, people's lives? Where do you fit in? So um, I, I'm, I'm not going to um, talk on behalf of my chief of content because he's very good at, at managing that um, content selection. And I think we're not anti-streamers either because we're also fans of many of those, um, many of those programs mm -hmm. and that sort of thing that, um, that, that, that goes on. Um, I'm going to talk about mass cultural experiences. So, yes, there are experiences like the Women's World Cup or the AFL or sporting events. News, Seven News mm. reaches 2 million Australians every night. That is the mm. news. Um, we, mm. you know, we report and build and shoot 11 and a half hours of news a day and we also do that digitally on news.com.au. Mm, and that is crazy. all about mm. sharing mass cultural experiences Farmer wants a wife. Mm. Nine million Australians watch that entire series. You know, it's mm. nine million Australians. They saw that as a mass cultural experience of wanting their favourite farmer to find their favourite wife. 
Home and Away, which again is one of our bigger programs, um, and you know we're, we're tipping about a million a, a million a night, is talking about real world issues from anything from, you know, date rape to depression to coming out. So mm-hmm. I think people need to broaden what they think mass cultural experience um, is all about. I think what the um, paid streaming platforms do very well is drama, and 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 in Australia mm-hmm. it's demonstrated that um, you know drama, which you can absolutely watch on Seven Plus, where we've got fifteen thousand hours of amazing premium content, that works well because people want to choose often when they want to watch that drama, they want to watch that on mm. their terms. Um, but that's that's entertainment, I guess. It's not so much about a mass cultural experience, and we're, we're leaning into the fact that. Yes, there is absolutely a role for niche, but we represent all of Australia and Seven is for all Australians. Mm. It's fa- the idea of um, distinguishing between entertainment and sort of cultural, I guess, like, you know, water cooler moments or whatever, I think that's a that's a really, really interesting um, idea. I want to go back to this idea of um, measurability, um, it, you know, because I guess that, you know, that feels like one of the areas where I guess in the last call it 10, 15 years, you know, obviously um, uh, programmatic and, and online has eaten like an insane amount of the advertising pie. How do you guys think about that at Seven? You know, what what sort of are you guys doing to, I guess, take take back some of that pie, some of that money that's shifted to Well, I think I, think to I sort of touched on that earlier, James. It's about myth busting. Mm. Um, because I think that, you know, we sold and talked about overnight ratings and people think that the numbers are small. But, you know, mm. if I was to tell you that Seven News, you know, can reach Australians and I wanted to reach 2 million Australians on YouTube, which I could do, YouTube couldn't guarantee for me to reach 2 million Australians in a one-hour highly mm. engaged uh, set of programming without any skippable advertising. That would be a complex mm. media buy that would probably take me about a week, a week and a half to hit that reach. Now, I'm not knocking mm. YouTube because I love it mm. and it absolutely has its space and role, but I think we've got to educate the market about the role of television as a platform that is complementary. I think we've got a myth bust around sort of some of the streaming numbers and um, streaming partners and what people are actually watching. Um, we take television for granted now, some of that is our own fault. Um, mm. Some of that is that we're not new and and shiny. Um, but, you know, right. Netflix in Australia, which, you know, I'm a Netflix fan. I'm not going to lie that I'm not. Netflix mm. subscription numbers are 6.5 million Australians. That's active subscribers. No, that's subscribers. I don't know their active numbers because I don't publish it. Mm. We reach 17 million a month. Like just sort mm. of, you know, um, mm. And I think, look, the other thing around, you know, programmatic, and I, I spoke on a panel in Cairns, you know, around this, um, and, and again, you know, I'm a passionate around digital first and pushing, pushing that out. Mm. There has been probably too much shift to programmatic. And the thing that terrifies me about that is in two years' time, we're going to be sitting down and looking at brands that are losing their equity, equity because we've become so mm. short-term Indeed, I was on a call with the amazing Gary Vaynerchuk a couple of weeks back and um, there was someone on the call talking about how they're going to move all of their money into programmatic and digital and and Gary is like, for God's sake, don't do that. Don't do that. Mm. So um, if we can get 1%, 2% back from some of the digital players, I I think we'll be in a good position. Yeah, and just to um, plug this podcast a little bit, I had the amazing Orlando Wood um, of System One on yeah. a couple of weeks ago, and we talked about um, effectiveness and really that you know sort of all of the um, data suggests that TV is still the most effective platform for for brand building for doing that sort of long term. Yeah, I'm gonna building. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be I, I think TV is one of the most effective mm. platforms. So, and I think this is where we fall into a trap of saying it's one or the other. I think the other right. thing we forget about is the content and what you put it. So you, you put shit content on TV, it ain't going to build your brand. Of course. You do shit programmatic that irritates people, it's not going to build your brand. Yeah. Um, what's your take on Netflix and um, them adding uh, advertising? 
Well, I think that it was a surprise, particularly like mm. 10 years ago when, you know, Reed, when they launched, said that, you know, they'd rather die than, than add an ad tier. And it certainly in this Australian market has not proven to be successful. But mm. I think that, you know, you just have to look at their financials. Mm. So it's very expensive. It is very expensive developing content, incredibly expensive developing content and mm. not having a really strong revenue stream in there. And, you know, I think that the challenge for a lot of these streamers, particularly over COVID, like a lot of organisations where you probably ended up then getting this really massive surge and as we've come out, people are sort of shifting and moving around a little bit more into different areas and they maybe don't have that loyalty is it, it affects mm. them. But, you know, again, you, 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 you talk about the fact that TV is dead and I just say go read our annual report and look at what our revenue and EBIT, well, certainly more our, not our revenue, look at what our EBIT was last year versus Netflix and Seven's doing better than Netflix. Mm. Mm, it's, it's fascinating because, like you say, so much of that, I mean, speaking of myths, feels like just conventional wisdom that I guess very few people go in and um and interrogate. Um, I want to move on to, you know, you've mentioned YouTube there a couple of times um, and I guess sort of like the new landscape of media. Um, you know, how does Seven think about, I guess, you know, me, I'm throwing more myths and maybe sort of um, Thanks, incorrect, con 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 conventional wisdom at you. But I guess there's, you know, more conventional wisdom, which is, you know, um, it's, you know, it's boomers watching TV and, you know, everyone under, I don't know, the age of 35 is just looking at their phone. How do you think about that sort of, I guess, the sort of the new generation, Gen Z or whatever you want to call it, and how do you guys attract a younger audience? Uh, do you attract a younger audience today? What sort of stories do you need to tell? Um, yeah, so I think you know, there's a couple of things. I think when we talk about TV, we've got to think about it in the way that a consumer talks about TV. So, you know, the average consumer considers Netflix to be TV, Stan to be TV, right. Seven to be TV. So you don't have people at home going, I want to have a linear free-to-air experience or I want to watch a streaming platform. That, that does not happen. Um, mm. And we also know that there is a, a, a truth if you don't have destination viewing still at 7 o'clock in most households around Australia, there is the conversation of what do you want to watch on TV. Now, at the moment, Seven's probably not right at the top of that because of mm. other um, very much um, uh, other choices. But we are attracting younger audiences. And, again, I think when you look at TV, if I talk about 7 Plus, which is our streaming platform, um, we have a really large percentage of sort of 18 to 39 females in particular, which are quite hard to get on there. Our mm. subscriber base on 7 Plus is 13 million. Um, of that, 6 million are active you know, we've got a program called The Rookie, which is about some US cop having a midlife crisis that has become a phenomena with um, 16 to 21 year old girls. And, you know, every week we're getting 600,000 of them coming in, binging it and, and being addicted to it. Do I think hmm. there is a job in certain programming like news and some of our entertainment programming to bring in younger audiences perhaps? The bigger job that I see from a marketing point of view is for those younger audiences is unpacking 7 Plus and that unbelievable mm. premium content that is just as good as what you would see on a paid streaming platform that they can enjoy on, on their terms. Mm. I want to move on to the quick fire round, Mel. Um, and the first question uh, is your favourite marketing campaign of all time. So it's a few years old, but without doubt, it would be um, imported from Detroit by Chrysler. So that sort of Super Bowl circa around 2011 uh, it was off the back of the GFC in the US, mm. where the Midwest was basically, you know, thrown into to bankruptcy and mm -hmm. was sort of felt to be... Um, unworthy and and not listened to and that entire campaign about Wyden and Kennedy really building into the thought process the ethos and the pride of Midwest America which is absolutely mm. their target audience I thought was spectacular 
and the pride mm. of at that period in time talking about purchasing a car that was imported from Detroit and you were proud of it, I think is mm. still one of the best campaigns and thinking and creativity that I have seen. Mm, mm, sounds brilliant. I I must admit I haven't seen that, so I'll have to go, go onto go, YouTube go, straight go, away. Go, Google it. Youth, youth, don't know what good advertising is. <laughs> uh, speaking of good advertising, what's the best brand in the world right now? And I'll say, you know, maybe not one of the obvious ones, Nike or Apple, or, you know, what what's a brand that you're loving at the moment? Maybe, you know, something that might not be as immediately obvious. Um, I mean, it's a really big question around what's the best brand in the in the world, right. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say a brand that I am inspired by and I love is an Australian brand that actually doesn't do any advertising on television, and that is Mecca. I don't know if you're familiar mm. with Mecca, um, yep. Yep. but I absolutely love Mecca as a brand for everything from its CX, its CRM, its um, experience in store, its choice of product. You know, I get three or four curated emails from them a week. Like mm. most people would say when you're looking at sort of from a CRM point of view, like forget that from a recency point of view, like that's a disaster. I open two. They're highly personalised um, and I, I think that they really put the customer at the um, at the centre of, of their business and then very successfully get customers to trade up. So businesses like that, inspire me um, mm. because they are doing things differently. They've obviously got the benefit of not having legacy platforms, so they're starting from scratch. But I feel um, I feel loved by Mecca. I probably overinvest mm. personally um, at Mecca as a result. But um, quite seriously, when you go look at their case studies and, and what they're doing um, in this world from retail and consumer engagement and digital first and mm. building out first mm. party data, it's it's world class. Yeah, it's funny you say that. So like we've been doing a deep dive into like loyalty and uh, consumer loyalty recently, given some product work that we're uh, working on. And it's funny that Mech is actually, on, you know, they've got that um what do they call it? A uh, beauty loop. Beauty loop is the yeah. sort of loyalty yeah. program, yeah, I'm, I'm and that's beauty one loop of the. Four. You don't want to know how much I spend a year to get to beauty <laughs> loop four, but it's a lot. Yeah, and it's fascinating because it, it's one of the examples that comes up time and time again as just world class. And I think it was like interesting, you know, one of the elements we're looking at in loyalty is the idea of surprise and delight. Um, and one of the mechanics in that program I found was really fascinating, which was, and you'll have to correct me if I've got it wrong, but I believe. Like if you're a member, you can go into a store anytime and if you're going to a wedding or a party, they will do your makeup for free as just a, a member perk. Um, that that and, is correct of know. a certain level, but I, I have to give you the tip. You've got to book in advance. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to do that, you, you do have to book in advance, but that is correct. But you sort of, you know, here's the thing. That's not a perk. That's upselling because guess what? Right. I buy the lipstick. Oh, actually, I really yeah, like yeah. that eyeshadow you put on me. So mm. they're, they're not giving anything away for free. No, no. But I think it's such a great example of, you know, to your point, putting the customer first and sort of that real sort of CX focus. I think it's a, a, a great example of that. Yeah. Um, next question, Mel. What's the most overrated trend in marketing right now? What are you sick of? <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, I sort of I, I thought about it. I don't... Um, I don't know if it's a trend in marketing. I think as an industry, what I'm sick of is CMOs bitching about the fact that um, they don't have a seat at the table in the boardroom or that their CFO mm. doesn't understand them and they don't get the budgets that they need. And and we've got to stop whinging and, and, and demonstrate our value. And there's a lot of amazing tools out to do that. So, um, mm. you know, I've always said if you've got the name, you know, the, the letter C in front of your title, you know, you've got to be able to sit at that table like every other person sitting around it. So um, I'm not saying it's not challenging, but I would love the industry, mm. and it's not everyone, but I'd love the industry to stop being victims and bitching mm -hmm. and, and, and being creative and going and selling a story and demonstrating how your investment is driving profitable ROI back to the business. 
Mm. Do you think that has that ch- have you seen that change throughout your career? Like, um, you know, have CMOs had a seat, lost a seat? Um, what's your sort of if you take a longer time horizon? What's happened I'm there old, to James. the role of the CMO? <laughs> <laughs> thanks, James. No, I'm just saying right. I'm not a CMO, right. well, not no, yet. Anyway, thanks, James. Oh, of course, <laughs> it's changed, and I think you know it's varied on the organisation. I mean, look. There were periods when I started a long time ago where, you know, um, the CEOs of very big corporations would come into the advertising agencies and, and make a call on that. And, you know, I spent a large part of my mm. career in, in, in London and, you know, you, you'd get the CEO of British Gas, you know, coming into the agency um, to see the work and they're in awe of the creativity. Mm. I think then what ended up happening is digital really started demonstrating a whole lot of sort of short-term growth and um, Mm. people started rethinking where the industry was. Um, I think a lot of the big consultancies, the big four consultancies came in and started demonstrating what they felt was right about marketing. So I think in some organisations what you've seen is CMOs have either had a seat at the table or they haven't had a seat at the table. Um, obviously, the ones that are more marketing first, like a Procter & Gamble, they're there all the time. Um, but I think where we are at the moment, if you were to speak to most CEOs, um, if they don't think marketing should have a seat at the table, and I'm not saying that there are some challenging sort of CEOs out there, I think a lot mm-hmm. of that is because um, people haven't been um, successful in demonstrating the worth of marketing and mm-hmm. the work, you know, the worth of marketing is to drive commercial gain. It's the only reason mm-hmm. it exists. So if you can't demonstrate commercial gain, if you cannot talk the language of finance, then you do not deserve to be sitting in the mm. Yeah, I think that makes total sense. Um, let's take the flip side. What's the most underrated trend in marketing right now? What are you really excited about that, you know, maybe you're not seeing get the attention it deserves? I think it's probably a couple of things. One of it's sort of going back to properly really thinking about building long-term brand equity. Mm. And I think that's super important. And a lot of people are dipping out of that. And yes, long-form content helps with that. But, but actually what... What is the story you're selling and what do you stand for? So mm-hmm. I absolutely think there is that. The The other underrated trend in marketing is curiosity. Hmm. Um, you know, the, the, the best marketing practitioners are curious about life, consumers, trends, tech, creativity, what people are doing outside of their own category, mm. trends, and and I think a lot of people are so caught up on case studies and what had worked or is working from the past sort of five, ten years that too many people aren't realising that, you know, that's our greatest, that's our greatest gift and, and what makes us different from many of the other people sitting around a, a boardroom table is that mm. the best marketeers are... Um, intuitive and educated in trends Mm. and experiences that are happening in the world so I don't see enough curiosity yeah that's a a great one speaking of um, trends in the world um, what's your take on the sort of the AI I know um, I read an article in um, where did I read it was it can't remember where I read it, but uh, anyway, I think you were you were talking about um, gener- generative AI and its potential. T- t- just shortly, you know, touching on that trend, what's your take on on that and the role it might play in? I guess marketing, but maybe also media and how you're thinking no, about I, it. I, I don't have that answer, and to be quite frank, if I knew, I wouldn't be talking to you. I'd be sitting on a super yacht down in Monaco because I would have made millions <laughs> of dollars. To be quite frank, so I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I absolutely want to look into it and, you know, explore it. I've made an amazing new hire in Lucio Ribeiro, you know, mm. who studied AI at, at, at MIT. I think we need to be cautious of it. But then I go back to things around the fact that, you know, we talk about Netflix serving up personalization. Guys, that's AI. So, mm. you know, I, I, yeah. I, I think that um, there's a lot of power in it. Um, I think we've got to be cautious not running after the next shiny thing. I've always been in these types of um, sort of new products coming to market. I'm I'm, I'm big about testing and 
mm. and learning and trialing things that are low risk and and we'll do that so um I'm, I'm not sure seven is very lucky to be very special partners at south by southwest this october here in sydney first time outside of austin and i know mm. that there are Many, many, many speakers and threads on that subject matter. So I'll be, um, I'll be listening. <laughs> yeah, me too. Um, last question, Mel. Who should I have on the show next? I would like to propose that you have Tony Bradbourne on the show next. Tony is the founder and chief commercial, sorry, chief creative officer of Special Group. Um, I obviously had an amazing relationship with them at um, Optus. Um, special group uh, founded in New Zealand where he is, have offices in Sydney, New York uh, and London. But they also were awarded recently at Cannes as the most creative independent agency in the world. Wow. Um, and yeah. Tony is a brilliant mind that is passionate around brands and how you connect brands with people and doing things in a really untraditional way. So um, I think he would be amazing on the um, mm. um, show next. And if you apologise for inferring that uh, I was old, I may even uh, provide an intro for you. That's the beauty of post-production. We'll just edit that right <laughs> out. <laughs> um, Mel, thanks so much for being on the show. I really enjoyed that. Thanks, James. Thanks for listening to the On The Moment podcast. If you liked this episode, make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss upcoming episodes. And to suggest a guest or provide feedback, please visit our dedicated podcast hub at ownthemomentpod.com 